Kyola, nami hinui ki koto. In a ro rangatira ma, no mai haidi mai fakto mai kitine hui mariko. Ko bari kota ho ko te kairahi o te putea fai fakaro. Orela tena koto, tena koto, tena tato kato, tihe mori ora. A very warm welcome to you all. Uh, I'm Barry Coates. I'm CEO for Mindful Money. Uh, Mindful Money is a charity that aims to make money a force for good, as well as providing radical transparency for Kiwi Saver and investment fund portfolios. We undertake these kind of seminars uh, in order to educate the public and highlight how investment can make a difference on issues that matter. This is the 19th seminar in this series, series of 20. Um, and you can see our website for recordings on climate change, net zero, social housing, impact investing, investment in Russia, uh, what else, nuclear weapons, animal welfare, green property, ethical investment standards, and te ao Māori perspectives on investment. So covered uh, quite a few topics and uh, you're very welcome to have a look at those videos you'll see the uh, the link in the chat tonight uh, we're changing gears we're talking about the crucial role of investment in conserving and regenerating nature and it is with great pleasure that I'd like to extend a welcome to the first of our panelists uh, Dr Simon Zadek uh, Simon is chair of the organization Finance for Biodiversity. He's senior advisor to the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, which somebody might call uh, uh, TNFD. Um, so so the, we'll try not to do too many acronyms, but, but that's one that we'll, we'll talk about tonight. So it's also co-lead of the Task Force on Nature Markets. As well as uh, Biodiversity Finance, he was previously head of the Secretariat for the UN Secretary General's Task Force on Digital Financing of the Sustainable Development Goals. Senior F Advisor on Finance in the Office of the UN Secretary General and Co-Director of the United Nations Environment Programme's Finance Inquiry. Amongst other things, he's co-chaired China's Green Finance Task Force, led the Green Finance Study Group Secretariat under the Chinese, German and Argentinian G20 presidencies. Uh, and then prior to this, he was Senior Advisor to the World Economic Forum and the Green uh, Global Green Growth Institute. Uh, uh, in the days that I knew Simon in the UK, uh, he was founder and CEO of the International Think Tank Accountability and Development Director of the New Economics Foundation. So, Simon, a very warm welcome. Thank you very much indeed. You have been doing a lot. Uh, I, uh, reading, I, reading, like, uh... reading, reading your, your bio is... is uh, uh, it gives it's just an exercise in awe at at, uh, at 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 your busyness. Yeah, well, it doesn't seem to have done much good if you look at the state of the world around us. But we'll pass that by for now. Yeah, well, I'm sure you've you've done more than most. Um, son, can you uh, kick us off on the topic for tonight? And we'll return to some of the other discussions later. Um, and you're welcome to use that that lovely presentation. Brilliant. Well, first of all, Barry, it's a delight uh, to be sharing this uh, platform with you um, after really uh, a number of years. Uh, and uh, I'm going to run through just a short uh, presentation, really, to just get a bit of spaghetti stuck on the wall um, about a few things that we can then come back to in discussion after Gail's opening reflections. So I think one of your colleagues is going to flip the, uh, the slides up onto the screen. Thank you, Olaf. Uh, we have them. Okay. Can you put that onto screen or that's just the way it is? Okay. Brilliant. That'll do just fine. Thank you very much indeed. So, um, so uh, as the wave suggests, um, I'm not going to run through all of the numbers. Um, they look different in different places, but if you just flip over the slide, uh, then I think probably the, the core of that visual 
uh, translates well into this story. You know, on the one hand, there are many metrics that point to uh, the continued deterioration of many aspects of biodiversity and more broadly nature. Uh, and on the other hand, to the right of the picture, um, it is, if you like, a truism that we are 100% dependent on nature, that anything that we trade or sell, our jobs, our incomes, what we eat, you know, all emanates from nature, including ourselves. Uh, and so clearly, um, this is a schizophrenic view uh, that describes us perhaps globally aptly, um, but it's not one that can be sustained. Slide, please. Um, and, and really just to sort of make the point, perhaps most directly to those who have a long tradition in thinking about conservation finance, it's not that little number on the left, how can we raise some money to invest in nature? Uh, we need to talk about the bigger pools of money. Uh, think of the stimulus um, during the pandemic, 15 trillion globally, very unconnected to climate and nature goals. Uh, think of our global debt markets, uh, particularly in the context of the kind of sovereign debt crisis that's emerging. Again, solutions very unconnected to that long-term underlying agenda of dealing with climate and nature. And ultimately, you've got you know, global financial markets, depending on which day you're in, 350 trillion, maybe 400 trillion US dollars. And of course, sitting somewhere alongside that about 35, 38% of uh, global expenditure is, of course, public finance. So we shouldn't forget public finance as part of this story. So we're talking about the whole banana, if you like, not some little bit of money that we're trying to raise to invest in something good on the side. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm not gonna go through this in any detail, um, but uh, it really is just trying to make one point, which is when we think about finance, our sort of instinct is to think about the flows of money, um, but, but actually finance is a system and it's sort of interwoven into the way the rest of our global economy functions. And this is a sort of very simplified schemata of, of how the food system and the finance system kind of interlock with each other and reinforce some of the chronic features of the food system that are degrading nature and won't survive climate change as we understand it today. And, and so, unfortunately, it's not just about how do we get that flow of money to go from A to B instead of A to Z. Uh, we have to sort of untangle the way in which finance interlocks with the way our global economy works. And the most obvious example of that is its complicated relationship with our global $8 trillion a year food system. Slide, please. And there's a lot to be done. You know, uh, I'll come back to a couple of new examples in a second, but this is a sort of condensed version of the many areas where finance for biodiversity, you know, has its pores uh, to varying degrees. And you can see sort of down the left, there's lots of work in improving the way nature is countered in markets. Lots of work that's needed in figuring out what the right regulations and laws and standards are that will shape uh, the way uh, finance relates to nature and climate. There's a whole bunch of stuff, obviously, which you know, isn't simply in the sort of social mobilization side, but in the way consumers behave, the way citizens behave as investors, uh, as savers, as voters, um, uh, as pension policy holders, all of that work, all, of course, we know in other contexts, but kind of connects in to this agenda directly. Public finance, I've already mentioned, you know, development finance institutions, I'm not sure if there's one uh, lurking in New Zealand, together have a combined uh, global balance sheet of about $12.5 trillion, big chunk of global investment, particularly in food and infrastructure. So those are public institutions that we own. 
yeah, they're effectively public financial institutions. And so we can direct them through our governments. And then nature markets, which I'll come back to perhaps in discussion, you know, is not so much just what's happening in the finance space, but sort of new generations of nature markets emerging. You know, we know about carbon markets. We're beginning to see a new generation of sort of broader biodiversity offset markets emerging. Is this sort of part of the solution or could this turn out to be just another part of the problem? Uh, flick the page, please. And and really, just to make the point, this is not a tabla rasa. There is a lot going on. You know, the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosure (TNFD) last acronym I'll probably use. Um, you know, is all about figuring the metrics that financial institutions should use to measure nature risk in the same way that the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure set up in 2015 um, is similarly focused on climate and carbon and lots of different things going on. I mean, look at that middle piece, a whole new arena of sort of legal architecture beginning to emerge starting in the Latin American cone about the rights of nature, obviously examples of that now also in New Zealand. Is this a niche or is this something that could be a significant part of the way nature and finance relate uh, going forward? So lots of different things in different sort of parts of the ecosystem from law you know to regulations to you know metrics data and so on and so forth if you could flick the page and and just sort of last on sort of stuff going on um you know particularly for the investment community you know there's a sort of there's an appetite for understanding risk but ultimately there's a greater appetite for understanding opportunity um, and, and so, you know, we need to think, you know, if clean energy is part of the way we think about opportunities in relation to climate, particularly the carbon side of climate, what does that all look like on the nature side? Because there isn't really an equivalent to renewables or clean energy as such when you think about nature. Um, but actually, in the sovereign debt market, there's all this stuff going on around nature debt swaps and new ways of thinking about how nature and climate can be part of the way sovereign debt trading works. Um, we've got, obviously, if you can see lurking in the middle of that picture, a whole new generation of farming systems beginning to emerge, alternative protein, perhaps being the more visible, but coming up fast behind vertical farming, 98% reduction in use of water, you know, very much removed from nature in order to protect it. Good things, bad things on both sides can be described. So lots of space things going on in the risk part which i just sort of highlighted on the previous slide and lots of things going on on the opportunity side too last slide please and so what's to be done uh, well obviously there's lots to be done and and lots being done but lots more that needs done we need to understand the facts and that isn't just the facts about nature but is the interlinkages between nature climate and investment really what what that looks like and i think there's very weak knowledge of what's going on in our ecosystem which is why conversations like this are so important for financial institutions and non-financial corporations the management of nature risk for some will be second nature if you excuse the pun if you're for example in the food production business um, but for most businesses it's a kind of a new game in town and after they've struggled to get kind of carbon and climate um, into the way they think about risk and opportunity. They're only just starting on a journey really about nature. Similarly to climate, <clears throat> lots of policy and regulatory developments actually much more than in the climate space, because obviously we've been regulating nature for decades and decades and decades and decades, and climate is a relatively new entrant into the policy and regulatory uh, space. And, and then at the end of the day, you know, we can't just look at <clears throat> policy constraints and risk. We have to think about market opportunities. What will be the triggers for large scale investment in nature positive, equitable uh, type opportunities? So perhaps, Barry, I'll, I'll stop at that point, pa pass back to you. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Simon. That's, uh, that's a, a, a wonderful starting point. Uh, I think what we might do is bring in Gail and then we'll we'll go straight straight to the panel. Uh, there's an enormous amount to chew on there. So so 
Welcome, Gail, and uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. So Gail's an ecologist, Gail Ogilvy, I should say. Gail is an ecologist by training. She's operated at the forefront of conservation, sustainability, and climate change sectors since the mid-1990s. She's founded and led environmental advisory services uh, here in New Zealand, in Australia, Hong Kong, China, and the Middle East, and specializing in sustainability reporting, assurance, carbon footprinting, environmental management systems, and ecological restoration. Gail's also headed local government environmental work programs, working alongside Mana Whenua, uh, Department of Conservation, and lots of community-led conservation groups to protect and, and restore native biodiversity. She's recently been appointed by the Minister of the Environment to serve on the Auckland Conservation and National Waste Advisory Boards. She's contributing to the Responsible Investment Association of Australasia, RIA, their uh, Nature Working Group program uh, to incentivize nature positive investments. Uh, she advises uh, clients on integrating ESG into their practices and leads a small business called Nature's Grace Aotearoa, which she founded last year to create New Zealand made gifts that inspire action to restore nature. So, Gail, I said that Simon has been incredibly busy, but so have you. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Gail, so, so um, Simon's given this great overview in the, in the presentation. Do you want to contextualise it a bit for us, for, for how it looks like in, in maybe in Australasia and, and in New Zealand? Yeah, thank you, Barry. And before I start on that task, uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel. It's an honour and I hope that the discussions are useful for people online and people who view the video. Uh, so, yeah, putting that broad international perspective that Simon has just provided us into a New Zealand context is, is quite a challenge given the breadth of the topic. Uh, so I'll have a go at it and keep it a very high level. So similar to Simon, um, we can delve into some of the detail in the discussion. Uh, so firstly, to make the point that New Zealand is regarded internationally and domestically as largely as some sort of green utopia that exists on the edge of the planet. But the reality of that perception um, is, is, is different. Uh, we've, the reality is actually a reasonably um, sobering picture. I won't go into too many statistics, but you can um, uh, usefully draw um, the latest statistics from the Ministry for the Environment, State of Environment Report, which is only produced every three years and was released last month. Um, there wasn't a lot of media coverage. So I'm not sure how many people have looked at the report. But some of the headline statistics are things like um, in the time that humans have been in New Zealand, that's Maori and Pakeha, we've destroyed 75% of our indigenous forest and 90% of our wetlands. That, of course, has created havoc for our um, native, largely endemic, i.e. found nowhere else in the world, um, plants and animals because of the significant habitat loss they've had to deal with. And on top of that, as we all know, in New Zealand, um, significant rates of um, invasive pest destruction. Um, uh, other worrying statistics are uh, declines in our freshwater quality and our soil quality, and probably the most concerning given the extent to which our economic well-being is dependent on primary sector, we're actually one of the most erodible countries on the planet. So to give you some numbers on that, New Zealand accounts for 0.1% of the land mass of the world. Um, with respect to sediment going into our rivers and oceans, we generate 2% of the mass um, that goes into um, worldwide oceans. So 
you know, as New Zealanders, we quite like the concept of punching above our weight. But in this case, we're punching 20 times above our weight with respect to soil erosion rates. Uh, so all of those challenges and the stats that I've outlined, and I know it's a grim picture and we don't want to slit our wrists about it, but just before we stop slitting our wrists, to make the point that climate change, of course, is going to exacerbate all those problems with respect to changes in temperature that influence habitat conditions, life cycles of our um, already highly threatened native species, um, uh, more intense floods, fires and droughts will all have an impact on those very vulnerable remnant species that we've got left. Um, the other point I wanted to make with regards to the New Zealand landscape is um, I think from our perspective as a nation, the stakes are actually really high. The stakes are high with respect to both the risks and the opportunities, and, and they're high for a few reasons. Firstly, as I've already mentioned, our economy is highly dependent on primary productivity, which in itself is highly dependent on healthy natural systems. And the last figure I saw was, I think it was 2021 data, that showed that um, of our export revenue for products, 75% of that was primary products. So we're heavily reliant as an economy on natural, healthy natural systems. Um, secondly, I referred to our um, clean green um, utopian image. I mean, that gives us the opportunity, as long as we can substantiate our claims, our customers, both in New Zealand and overseas, are preconditioned to be thinking that the type of product that comes from New Zealand will be nature and climate positive. So that's that's an opportunity for us um, that's relatively unique, unique, shared with other countries, but certainly is the case in New Zealand. Thirdly, our national identity is directly connected to nature. I mean, I'm not sure of any other countries um, in the world that refer to their citizens as a native animal, in our case, Kiwis. You know, we, we call Aussies Aussies. We don't call them kangaroos or koalas. So we, we, we're intrinsically connected to nature through our identity. And, and the last but not least unique part of the New Zealand picture is um, our Te Ao Māori worldview, um, which has all of the elements that we need as a platform to develop and accelerate solutions to the crisis that we're in at the moment. I mean, it has, as, as part of its concepts, and, and I'm not Māori, so I'll, I'll just summarise because I'm not well placed and, and won't be as eloquent as the Indigenous people about um, describing the aspects of their worldview, but um, everything is interconnected. That's really important. Long-term thinking, intergenerational thinking and making decisions about long-term gain. And also that concept that um, uh, we are just part of nature. We're not separate. Um, and that uh, mm. sense that we've had of being separate to and controlling nature um, has created some of the problems we're seeing. So that's the uniqueness for New Zealand. I wanted to spend a few minutes on the opportunities. Um, I think we've discussed this before, Barry, but... Um, and Simon mentioned the TNFD coming out. I can use that acronym now, Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures. So I think there's a, a quite worrying scenario that the first touch point that our investment sector and business has with nature is going to be the TNFD. And it's potentially going to be received as another regular, well, not regular but certainly compliance exercise, um, you know, a task to be done. And alongside that, potentially a focus on risks. You know, Simon was very careful about talking about opportunities as well as risks. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes on opportunities um, because I think they're here in New Zealand and I think they will continue to grow. When I talk about opportunities, I'm talking about business activity and investment in that activity that realises both a financial return and improves our natural environment. And the reason I say this is going to increase is sort of self-evident in a way. Consumers, as we recognise the crisis that we're in, are going to increasingly preferentially buy um, nature and climate positive 
goods and services. And our, that includes our export customers. We're already seeing that in that Nestle is now requiring all of their suppliers to um, uh, generate the products using regenerative agriculture. And of course, they're a big customer of Frontera. So the trends that we're seeing at the moment are just going to increase. So that correlation between financial return and environmental benefit is going to keep getting closer. Um, currently though, um, we have uh, firstly direct um, carbon credits from at the moment, unfortunately our emissions trading scheme is quite narrowly designed. So you're only eligible for those credits if you're planting, specifically planting native, and at the moment exotic, but that might change, um, native trees. But there are a whole range of other, what they call nature-based solutions to climate change. Internationally, they estimate that that's going to account for about 30% of the carbon absorption we're going to need if we're going to meet our targets by 2030. Um, so those nature-based solutions that, um, that, that we have here as potential in New Zealand, wetland restoration, peatland restoration, some of the blue carbon um, kelp um, restoration projects that simultaneously sequester carbon and improve um, environmental outcomes. And so future versions of the emissions trading scheme will expand to um, make that sort of activity eligible. And again, we're seeing this in Australia. They just passed some legislation that um, will allow for uh, landowners over in Australia that ha have high value ecological sites on their rural properties to receive carbon credits directly for ecological restoration. So that change is already occurring. And um, Simon touched on that as well. The other one I won't go into because we want to get into discussion, um, but regenerative agriculture is another one and some of those um, technologies. So the opportunities are already here and they will continue to grow for the investment sector and business activity. Great. Thank you. So that note, I'll pass on to you, Barry. <laughs> Thank you, Gail. And um, Simon, uh, please uh, come come back and, and join and we'll have a chat. So, you know, I'm going to be a bit of a provocateur about this. So if we're talking about mainstream finance, then, you know, we've heard for a long time that that there's going to be respect for nature and nature markets and debt for nature swaps and so on. And yet we see mainstream finance still contributing to, to massive deforestation, the destruction of our environment, to the sixth great extinction of biodiversity, which is going on at the moment. Do, do, we, do we need the, the, the kind of uh, campaigning for vilification, vil, vilification that has targeted fossil fuel companies, for example, uh, about just those who would who would finance the destruction of nature. I mean, it's uh, it seems seems to me that that we could live in a, a sort of a a scenario where we're talking a lot about opportunities, but actually the mainstream finance is still financing the destruction of nature. Simon, you 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 kind of talk and think about this a lot. Do you do you? Sort of wake up at night saying, you know, maybe maybe we're spending a lot of time being optimistic about the one percent and ignoring the rest. So, so the answer to your first question is yes. And just to remind people what the first question was, you know, do do we need to have more aggressive public campaigning? Um, there is increasingly aggressive campaigning around the role of the financial community um, uh, in nature destruction. Uh, and uh, I would point, for example, to a recent piece by Global Witness um, called the Deforestation Dividend that puts some numbers on the benefits to the financial sector directly of uh, nature crimes, not just deforestation. Uh, and, and so uh, more connections are needed. Um, there's been a long time process of social mobilization and campaigning around particular business sectors and particular business enterprises. But I think we're at an early stage in really highlighting the role of the financial community in this whole agenda. So, so the first part of the story is yes. Second part of the story is, um, although 
as finance for biodiversity, we're involved in initiatives like TNFD, so metrics, nature risk, disclosure, and so on. Um, we take a view this is a slow incremental piece of the story. So it will raise awareness as much as it will drive actual capital reallocation. Um, and we point to other um, more systemically influencing activities that are needed to really shift capital at scale. Um, a couple of examples of that, um, anti-money laundering rules, you know, which we might normally think about as having something to do with terrorism or, you know, drugs, um, of course, is absolutely relevant as it relates to environmental crimes. <clears throat> and when we look at, for example, uh, deforestation in the Amazon, um, a significant portion of that deforestation is illegal and is benefiting global financial institutions by providing cheap ecosystem services to companies that they're investing in. And so we, along with others, are campaigning heavily for a much broader and deeper application of anti-money laundering rules as it relates to nature crime. One of many examples, Barry, of having to move beyond um, sort of incremental data-driven sort of financial market efficiency type approaches. One other example, then I'll pass it back to you, um, is actually the sort of the lords of the financial system, which are the central banks and financial regulators. Um, really from 2015, we had our first set of breakthroughs in bringing central banks to the table, uh, uh, whereas hitherto they had effectively said, climate and sustainability is just not our business. That's no longer a credible, a, a credible position on their part. The G20 and other processes have pushed central banks to think about climate and financial stability much more centrally and signal to the investment community the longer term implications for, for capital allocation. We now begin to see the same thing happening um, uh, for nature, or, or at least let me say for biodiversity. Um, since nature covers mm. you know, minerals on the ground, it's a slightly broader way of thinking about the world. So the answer to your question is, we shouldn't be, we should be optimistic because it gets us out of bed, but we have to be strategically skeptical and understand that it's a range of different measures that will deliver from sort of insider market efficiency type work to regulatory liability litigious type work to public campaigning and other forms of social mobilization. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Simon. That's uh, very interesting. I'm, I'm glad we can get out of bed in the morning with, with an optimistic view. Um, Barry, Gail, just, uh, how, how do you just to it? add to that, though, um, as well, because you your suggestion was around showcasing, you know, the bad guys. And, and absolutely, that could potentially be part of the future, and that might be a driver for change. But I think the other probably um, more impactful approach is showcasing really good practice. So we, we, we change the thinking, you know, for years in New Zealand, um, we've had this built into, embedded into our DNA, you know, there's a trade-off situation here. You can either have economic prosperity and more cows on the paddocks and food for your kids, or you can have lovely clean rivers. So there's a, there's a deeply embedded I'm overstating this, but there is, is, is an element of embedded trade-off thinking in New Zealand, possibly overseas as well, um, but certainly alive and well still here. And I think it's shifting that through potentially showcasing um, the bad actions. But when I was in council, one of the things that I was responsible for was incentivizing rural landowners to um, practice, it wasn't called regenerative agriculture there, but it was certainly environmentally responsible agriculture practices. And where we came from is let's give a megaphone to the farmers and the landowners that are keeping nutrient and sediment on their land rather than it going into the rivers and also making more money. So financial gain um, and environmental protection. So I think it's a mix of... Um, and, and, and with that as well, if we're talking about solutions, although that reality exists now, it doesn't have to be a trade-off. Um, I believe that is going to continue to grow. But also there's an important role for government to play here, I think, to amplify 
that um, connection between financial return and environmental stewardship, um, as we've seen already with the emissions trading scheme and we will see in the future with other trading um, uh, opportunities for biodiversity. So I think with that sort of amplification from government, then that's going to be a big part of the change hmm. that we desperately and quite quickly. So when, actually. <laughs> when we're talking about uh, solutions, Simon, I was struck by one of your slides where where you said there's uh, there's a lot that has to be done, and you listed some various uh, key things that can be done, valuing nature and and nature markets and and so on. I very often hear sort of the view that. Um, it's all about getting the prices right. So if we get the prices right and we value nature, then problem solved. Or we just need a market for, for nature that can be invested in. Or we just need a regulatory structure so, so that we can protect things that need to be protected. I guess what you're pointing to is actually more of a holistic approach to say that actually we need... Uh, we need strategies that combine these different approaches in order to to tackle what is uh, diverse problems uh, and with diverse solutions. Is that is that the implication yeah, I mean, from from what you're saying? Yeah, I mean leveraging <coughs> Gail's <coughs> the the last round of comments. I, I don't think it's terribly helpful to try and decide whether we need bad news or good news. You know that the history of social and political change always involves both yeah, yeah. i can't think of any exceptions whether it's you know uh, you know anti-slavery movements I, I mean we could go through them you know if we had all night which we don't have so we should stop going should we give good news or should we give bad news and and we should focus on how the combination of the two and working with individual cases as well as system conditions all needs to be done at the same time it's not an either or yeah, yeah that's a kind of a wrong that's a wrong view and it's it's an unhelpful debate yeah and and so you know the price of nature is a really good example and in a sense is the the lightning rod for exactly this point um you know we don't put a price on slavery we say it's illegal yeah uh, and yet folks can continue to fund coal-fired power stations as long as the risk is acceptable yeah and and so we as a society we kind of wobble between price-based solutions so market solutions and and verbarian institutional rule-based solutions yeah and and i think with the scale of challenges that we have in front of us around climate and nature and the possible fallouts on how societies work we obviously need both and the tension is that they both can bring unintended consequences. You know, monetizing nature in the wrong ways, even if it ups the price of nature, can actually lead to its further degradation. But relying on policy and regulation, which can be gamed and is often behind the line and where there is corruption and other problems in many countries, New Zealand, I'm sure, accepted, can also not always be effective, but be effective. Uh, and so we do need both. So to give an example, uh, and really leveraging from something that Gail said, we do know that the estimates are that 30 to 40% of all nature-based solutions associated with voluntary carbon trading will come through sequestration opportunities in nature. Yeah, that's sort of the estimates out there. But we also know it's becoming clearer and clearer that the early stages of immature voluntary carbon markets have led to profoundly inequitable deals being done with the owners and stewards of nature. You know, with deals running at two, three, four, five dollars a ton, undiscounted over long periods, where the trader is immediately cashing in by flipping them at 20, 30 bucks a ton. And not only is that inequitable, but it leads to not enough money on the table to be able to actually sustain the nature asset, which is the underlying idea. And so actually the project fails. And, and so we know that there are important upside market opportunities and approaches 
to securing nature as well as climate goals. But we also know that unless markets are correctly governed, are suitably transparent and so on and so forth, markets tend to be gamed by traders with narrower shorter term interests. And that's not just a problem with nature and climate, but it's obviously an existential problem if we overly rely on markets for delivering climate and nature outcomes. Good. Um, to our audience, uh, there is a, a box down below called Ask a Question. Uh, please use it to, to uh, put in Q&A for, for well, questions for, for our panel. Uh, and uh, we're going to run for another um, 10 minutes or so. So, so good. I see a question coming. Um, while I look at that, Gail, uh, can you sort of describe from your perspective the, the sort of uh, where you think New Zealand is on uh, some of the investment opportunity? You, you started to talk in your, in your opening remarks about, mm -hmm. about the investment opportunity. What are a couple of favourite ones that you see where there are emerging some both investment opportunity and uh, real solutions from from a, a biodiversity conservation perspective? Yeah. yeah, Barry, I think it's fledgling. Uh, I think it's actually quite challenging. You know, I mentioned obviously um, the emissions trading scheme as it stands allows for uh, direct financial returns associated with planting. Um, beyond that, not. Um, and the other examples, regenerative agriculture, the one that is often put forward um, as a, a sort of a best case gold standard in New Zealand is Calm the Farm, um, which has taken quite a, a solid, rigorous data-based approach to what they um, improve from a natural environment perspective and obviously the financial side. Um, and then there's, there's a range of blue carbon type technologies that get quite a lot of um, media coverage. So, but it, 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 it's quite scattered, but that's not to say that it's not here. I just don't think we're intentional about looking at our business and our investment activity with that lens. We have been intentional about looking at it from a carbon lens and looking at results from a nature lens, unfortunately, is more complex. You know, we don't have the single currency. I know climate change is, is a broader problem because you've got adaptation and mitigation. But on the mitigation front, you at least have a, um, a pretty well-defined currency around tons of greenhouse gas emissions per annum or whatever it is, whereas with nature, it's such a broad field and so many potential metrics around defining what an improvement in nature that sits alongside a financial return looks like. Um, that I think that's part of the challenge. We just haven't put the effort into identifying those and um, both, and I completely agree with you, um, Simon, both showcasing the good and the bad as part of the, the behaviour change thinking um, and using it as a way to remove some of the barriers as well because, you know, it's been great to focus on opportunity, but there are real barriers around metrics, about long-term thinking. Um, we haven't really touched on the fact that our, our economic systems and our political systems are based on short-term um returns and in many cases you'd be in a situation where you could um get certainly get that win-win that i'm talking about from a long-term perspective um and actually planting um natives versus exotics is a really good example long term it's um, you've got a driver that don't necessarily help nature in the long term. So I, I think a quick answer is this fledgling, but I don't think we've looked closely enough. Thanks, Kat. So, um, Simon, we've got a question come in from, from one of our leading environmental policy people in New Zealand, Simon Terry. So uh, Simon talks about... Uh, wants to sort of burrow into the issue of uh, 
of markets. And he's saying, is there any consensus on, on what the right opportunities are for pricing nature and those that would deliver more harm than good, which you, which you referred to? So what are the conditions under which pricing of nature is actually going to deliver those kind of benefits? Often they're, they're, they're spoken of without, without the nuance and without the conditions as to where you also need regulation. So if I stick with um, the carbon nature interface for a second, because it's sort of real and live and out there, and then I can always go on to a couple of other examples. What's clear is that at this early stage in the development of carbon markets, um, the supply side, the nature supply side is immature in terms of their access to information, their ability to negotiate, their understanding of what the right terms should be and so on and so forth. And absolutely to Gail's point, you know, we can point to amazing examples of profit sharing agreements and other really excellent approaches to operating in voluntary carbon markets in relation to nature asset owners, but that's not where the bulk of the market is. So pointing out those good practice cases in ways that strengthen the negotiation position of nature owners and stewards becomes really important. More structurally, we just put out a paper specifically on the governance of voluntary carbon markets as it relates to nature assets, uh, arguing for a much more radical approach to transparency than is being envisaged currently across all voluntary carbon markets. And we're very much of the view that it should come down to transaction level transparency, which at the moment simply isn't the case. Um, secondly, we've taken a view that although traditional grievance systems in the main don't work well in highly liquid markets they work much better in static projects um, we need to construct the ability for those that are impacted or have additional information about problems with individual investments to find voice right across the value chain so all the way from the transaction through the trading platform and up um, and building that kind of voice mechanism which goes well beyond sort of community engagement we think would play a really good role, not just in socializing voluntary carbon markets and their relationship to nature assets, but actually improving the integrity of carbon markets and ultimately their effectiveness at doing the job that they've been created to, uh, to evolve. Now, in the biodiversity offset space, you know, which is much further, there are a host of other problems, largely because a liter of water in Amsterdam is not the same as a liter of water in northern Kenya. And so the issue of particularly cross-border trading is a much more complicated agenda. But there's no doubt that these biodiversity credit markets will emerge. There will be secondary trading. There will be liquidity. And there's a hell of a lot of work to do in trying to make sure that they function effectively. Traditional governance mechanisms can play a role, such as those I've described. But if we look, for example, at one of the partners of the Task Force on Nature Markets, which we run at F4B, is with HBAR Foundation, which is the non-profit foundation spin-off of Hedera, the blockchain and tokenization platform in Australia, where we're actively looking at how blockchain and tokenization can play an effective role, not at solving all problems. I'm not a blockchain evangelist, but at increasing the transparency uh, of these sorts of markets where you have high liquidity and multiple trading activities, but you need to track the effect of it all the way through highly liquid markets. So I think there's a lot to do. I think there's a lot that can be done. And, and I would end perhaps where some would wish me to end, others not, there are some aspects of nature that shouldn't be traded. Yeah, and, 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 and although that's the calling card of significant parts of the environmental community, many indigenous communities for very good reason, actually, None of us have much clarity on where that line should draw. We all trade nature because we're wearing clothes. Yeah. And so none of us can argue that we're against the trading of nature, but we do need to draw some lines. I come back to my example of slavery. It's not a tradable issue. It's just illegal. You go to jail if you get caught. And we have to decide where those lines to monetization actually are. And actually, despite endless debate, I don't think we're anywhere close to getting a feel, a common feel as to what those boundary conditions should look like. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. In New Zealand, uh, one of the people I 
have admired for a long time, Monica Hanare from, from University of Auckland Business School, talks about uh, iwi in New Zealand uh, uh, putting their, their mountain, their manga, on, on their balance sheet as being an asset which is valuable to them, but not necessarily in monetary terms. And so I think very much from, from New Zealand, you see, you're seeing an understanding through giving legal rights to the Whanganui River, et cetera, that, that there is a process of recognizing the value of nature without necessarily valuing it economically. So I think that, as you say, I mean, that's, that's sort of the kind of, of uh, ways to keep parts of nature out of the monetized markets mm -hmm. and while respecting them and uh, and and um, conserving them um, we're going to have to draw to a close this has gone really quickly very enjoyable both of you so um a couple of uh, comments just at the end um but where, where do you see some some real kind of optimism coming so we we're, we're sort of started mm. off with with a uh, slightly uh, uh, mm. kind of pessimistic starting point but uh, um, what is it that you see that 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 you can look at and say y y yes I can see how this can go to scale I can see how it can move mm. capital markets I can see how this can can really make a difference to an ecosystem to biodiversity etc Gail you first. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Barry. Um, I am optimistic most of the time uh, about change uh, for the better and the, a couple of reasons for that. Obviously, the next generation and the extent to which they are embedding um, environmental stewardship into who they are what they buy, how they get around. And I don't think, I've seen waves of that before, you know, in that 18 to 24 age group and then um, the generation moves on to family and kids and that, that, that idealism around environmental and social change dissipates slightly. I, I don't think that's the case anymore. I think this is just thinking about your about the way, Simon, I think this is a way that is going to continue to grow. So we've got the basis for more and more solutions. The, the element of pessimism I've got is timeframes. Um, I just think some of these things we've been talking about, um, changing systemic change to our financial systems that actually allow us, uh, require us to some extent to have some humility because we have thought that we've had the answer that we will just control and exploit and grow and, you know, um, case in point, you know, um, first world countries. But actually it's now becoming really clear when we look at the planetary boundaries that we can't. So we have to reset that, uh, some things and that requires political courage and it requires humility and it requires probably as a result of those things quite a long time and we, we don't necessarily have that time. And just before I, I stop talking, I did also want to touch on that monetization because I think that's really important. And I was conscious when I was talking about finance and biodiversity, I'm an ecologist. So there is an intrinsic value. It's just we've got to be careful that um, that doesn't dominate. I hear funds, for example, that talk about people and planet before profit. I mean, that's commendable. But actually, that's going to keep us playing around the edges. We've actually got to correlate financial return with nature improvements to get real action. So that's a mixed answer, but cautiously um, optimistic. A few final thoughts, Simon? Yeah, so I'll, uh, so I, I, I would echo uh, Gail's points and perhaps point to two or three absolute specifics very, very quickly. The first is that we can move more quickly on nature because of what we've learned about how to deal with climate, even although climate remains, you know, an unaddressed challenge. Yeah, so accessing central banks, new types of regulations, how to engage around opportunities, metrics issues, um, litigation, campaigning, right across the plus to the negative, 
you know, we're moving much more quickly in the nature space, despite its complexity, because of what we've all been doing for the last 10 years, particularly in the carbon space, number one. Mm. Number two, mm. and sadly, there are two accelerators that come from the current crisis. Um, uh, and by the current crisis, I mean the combination of the pandemic and the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, one is that the pandemic has created a huge emerging market sovereign debt crisis um, that is problematic in multiple ways and tragic and difficult, and yet has opened opportunities for bringing nature and climate more deftly and rapidly mm. in the way sovereign, sovereign debt markets work. And that's a hundred trillion dollar market, let's not forget. Uh, and secondly, and even more tragically, the catastrophic increase in food prices uh, and restrictions that are emerging across the globe in terms of export uh, prohibitions of both food and fertilizer will rapidly accelerate our views about how the global food system needs to change and how the fragility of these long distance, cheap, pile them high food uh, models are, are really going to work. And that's both for entirely the wrong reason. And yet the truth is, is that although I'd love us all to change quickly because we're inspired, quite often humans change quickly in the context of crisis and disaster. And this is certainly one that will drive change in both of those spaces and possibly elsewhere. Hmm. Thank you both. Those, uh, those, those thoughts uh, certainly ring true. So uh, uh, hopefully we won't need more crises to, uh, to uh, trigger unexpected change. Um, I found this really interesting and uh, I hope the audience did too. Um, for those of you out there who are financial managers and, and uh, um, keen to act on this, then, then there is a Responsible Investment Association of Australasia a working group on nature-based finance and uh, certainly Mindful Money is keen to do some more work on this in New Zealand as well and we look forward to future opportunities to talk about this in seminars and uh, and conferences. So uh, um, thank you again. Um, we're going to wrap up. I just wanted to say uh, for those who were waiting for our third panellist, uh, uh, Guy Williams from Deloitte's, I should have explained Guy got caught by a postponed flight uh, and is in the air at present or, or maybe he's just landed uh, but uh, unfortunately he wasn't able to attend um, even so um, we had a fabulous discussion thank you very much Simon Zadek and Gail Ogilvy for this great discussion uh, I think there were some fascinating insights and thank you both for your insights and wisdom and thank you uh, Barry Thank, Thank you, Simon. You, Thank you, uh, Thanks also to our sponsors for the series uh, AMP, Booster, Generate KiwiSaver, Harbour Asset Management, and PwC. Mm -hmm. And for the audience out there, we are gearing up for our exciting last seminar in this series uh, next week. So join us for a, uh, a kind of controversial seminar. Um, Simon mentioned uh, blockchain tracing for uh, nature markets. We're going to talk about blockchain beyond Bitcoin to explore some of the potential for helpful disruption uh, to a digital world. Um, so please join us for, uh, for that interesting discussion next week, 7.30 on Wednesday. Until then, um Namihi Nui Kia Koto Kakiteano. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.